House is where the democracy is supposed to happen in our system. It's where the, the people are supposed to have the best opportunity to affect the direction of the government and say where they want to go. We have this incredible disconnect between, I think, that aspiration, that value, and the very real fact that right now we can reject almost every winner in, 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 in the great majority of House races. Um, that individual accountability is a question mark in the current system. And then we're also at a point where overall leadership leadership accountability of the House is also a question mark. Um, and this isn't a partisan statement to say that, it's just saying that in a de democratic system, and this is where the democracy is supposed to happen, we think there should be individual accountability, there should be leadership accountability. And it is rooted in a statute that can change, but it's maybe a different statute than I think many think, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Chris has done a lot of uh, thinking and working around the issue of, of fair representation, and maybe we'll give a, a, a broad, broad introduction to the issue, and then we'll, we'll talk about this, this really important report we've done about U.S. House elections and, uh, and uh, ways to fix it. Hey, thanks a lot. I gave an introduction earlier. I thought what we're talking about here is uh, we call it fair representation voting, or fair vote, and, uh, but it's basically proportional representation. So I've been advocating this for over 15 years. So what is proportional representation? Well, I think in the United States there's a lot of myths and misconceptions regarding this form of voting. Okay? People think proportional representation, their impression of it is that's how they vote in Israel. You need 2% of the vote to get elected. Okay? And then in Israel, where they have proportional representation, you don't vote for a person, you vote for a party. Okay? Another thing is they have a national election. All of Israel is one big constituency. Okay, they don't have districts. They don't have a second vote. Right? And uh, so there's this misconception about perhaps fair vote is for, for, um, proposing this kind of system for the United States. The truth is, is we're not. We're proposing American versions of proportional representation. And that's why we give it the distinction calling it fair representation voting, okay? Fair rep representation voting is different from the Euro or the Israeli model, is where you vote for a person and not necessarily a party. Americans like that. They like to vote for people. A candidate, not necessarily a party, especially in a two-party system. Though, what would, you know, uh, people need that kind of cue depend on the key on the ballot, so I'm not trying to discourage that partisanship. In the United States people vote for the person, not the party. Another thing about fair representation voting, the American version of proportional representation, is the thresholds are much higher. For Israel, it takes 2% of the vote. In Russia, they have uh, uh, proportional representation. It's like 7 or 8% to get elected. Okay? American versions, you can have 33%, uh, 25% uh, of the vote to get elected. That kind of threshold, 15%, it depends on what kind of system you're using. So that's, American version is more conservative, than, say the Euro or a lot of these other systems. So how does it work? Well, we know how these systems work in the United States because there's so many examples of them. There's a long history in the United States of this type of voting. Like in Connecticut, when you vote for like county commissions, say there's a three seats on the board, you get one vote. Voters get one vote to elect all three seats. So what does that mean? It means there's minority representation. There can be two Democrats and one Republican on the board or two Republicans and one Democrat. Okay? So that's what proportional voting and fair representation does. It facilitates minority representation. And that's the reason why another part of the history of this voting in the United States is with the Voting Rights Act. Okay? So when you have, in many instances, you have a case against a jurisdiction where there's been 
integration of polarized vote. And many times the remedy is there to create a majority minority district. Okay? However, sometimes that's not possible because the way the makeup of this group of voters is too dispersed in the jurisdiction. So instead of making this crazy gerrymander majority minority district, they make uh, an at large election, say three seats, that uses a system like you know, I mentioned in uh, Connecticut. There's another system where you give the voters power. You want to elect three seats, you give a voter three votes. It makes sense, right? Three seats, three votes. However, the voter has the power to choose how to cast that vote. You can give all three votes to one candidate, or you can give two candidates two votes to her and one to them. So that's worked in the Voting Rights Act, too, where Minority groups can all come together behind one candidate and give their candidate all three votes, and that person gets elected. Okay? At the same time, then you have Democrats elected and Republicans from the same district. And it's, uh, it's legal in the United States. It has a long history. There's, there's a scholarship. And so what we're proposing with fair vote is take these, these types of systems and we use it to elect the United States House of Representatives. So how would that work, look like? So you have a state like Louisiana, has six U.S. House seats, right? Right now, there are five Republicans and one Democrat, which is a result of the Voting Rights Act. There wouldn't be a Democrat. There wouldn't be a uh, Democrat. Uh, uh, racial minority representation if it wasn't for the voting rights act. Okay? But so you have five Republicans and one Democrat. Well Fair was proposing that we uh, have instead of six single member districts in Louisiana, we have two three member districts. Where voters use this kind of fair representation money that I mentioned. There's another way you can do it. You can uh, give voters they can rank a candidate. First choice or second choice or third choice, because it has the same effect. So there would be two Democrats elected out of, could be two Democrats elected out of Louisiana and four Republicans. Every African American in Louisiana would have representation in Congress, not just the, uh, those voters in this majority minority district. Same thing with Massachusetts. You can have, they have nine seats. There could be three three-member districts. The voter could rank the candidates in their order of preference, like they do in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They have this fair representation of them. Okay? And so right now there are nine U.S. House members out of Massachusetts. They're all Democrats. With our plan, there would be three there would be three Republicans and six Democrats. Okay? So why is that important that Northern Democrat, Northern Republicans have a voice and Southern Republican Democrats have a voice? I was getting mixed up because I'm an independent. <laughs> I'm conflate uh, these parties. Like, there's a difference, I know that. Why is that important? Well there would be more there would be more Southern Democrats. There'd be more rural Democrats. There would be more urban Republicans. Okay? And what we're what we argue with Fairbo that that would, could, could lead to less polarization in the US House. And it would be the House would look more like a generation ago where you have uh, Republicans like John B. Anderson, who's our chair, our former chair. Okay? He was a moderate Republican out of Illinois. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was uh, uh, Gerald Ford out of Michigan. Okay, you these blue dog Democrats also, and it's these people who are bridge builders. So I'll finish my comments with um, how's it how's it going? Have a seat. Um, well, how do we do this then? We changed a 1967 statute 
that uh, have single member districts from the U.S. House. It doesn't take a constitutional amendment. It just takes the political will. The political will to do something in the U.S. House of Representatives. <laughs> okay. Um, that's our plan. We want to uh, decrease uh, polarization in the House. We want to give every, almost every voter, um, certainly every Republican and Democrat in the United States, actual representation in the House. So if you're a Democrat in New York City, oh, I'm sorry, if you're a Republican, I keep doing that all day. If you're a Republican in like New York City or Boston or somewhere, you can have a U.S. House member. If you're a Democrat somewhere in, in one of these red states, they wouldn't be as red anymore. They're kind of okay? So we give people, you know, you're a taxpayer, you're a uh, subject to the laws and the rules of the land, you deserve representation. So create more opportunities. What's another opportunity to, uh, for election? to do space for uh, third parties and independents. Because these are candidate-based election reforms. So bring more people in, more ideas in. And uh, that's, our, that's our vision. It's a big deal, but I think the time is right for reform in the first house. Great. And then we have, <clears throat> we're going to have visual. We've got a great report to talk about, um, and we've got the two main authors of it to talk about it. And, and uh, Drew Spencer, our staff attorney, is going to talk about the bill that's ready to go in, in the House. As we're making this transition, I do want to mention there's a history of legislation about this issue. Uh, which we'll talk about. The, the idea of single member districts in Congress were are not in the Constitution. In fact, in early Congresses uh, for the first 50 years, about a quarter of House members were not elected in single member districts. Um, as recent as the 60s, there were states that did not use single member districts for the House. And, um, and it's, and it's an uh, issue also of these different voting methods that Chris mentioned also have a long history. Um, resources associated with this is there's a report out there about. Um, it's an important day for, uh, month for women, uh, uh, Women's History Month, and, and uh, this report about the state of women's representation I think is exceptional. It has state profiles online. It's not in the printed one, but every state there's a two-page profile of that state and the conditions of, of, of women. But women are affected directly by the, 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 the district, senate, uh, district system, voting rights. And this report, I think we don't have copies here, right, but this report about uh, the condition of the South, which we may touch on, uh, which, which models different approaches to redistricting in the South and compares that to Mulcahy District, it really should be seen as well. But the uh, highlight we want to zero in on is uh, monopoly politics. And so Devin McCarthy, I've uh, been with us for a couple of years uh, and has been a lead author of this. And uh, is Andrew going to be part of this or just Devin? And then just Devin and then, um, and then uh, Bruce Spencer will, will follow up. So thanks, Devin. So uh, Chris just gave a great explanation of this reform and a little bit about why we think it's important. But um, my job at Fairmode has really been to kind of figure out um, the extent to which we actually need this. I mean, it's, it's a big change. It's not a crazy or an unprecedented change, but it's, it's definitely a big change. So uh, in order for us to, to make such a big change in American elections, there needs to be a compelling reason uh, why we want to do that. And Fairvote has been producing a report every couple of years um, since, since pretty much its inception. Um, it's called Monopoly Politics. And what this report does is it looks at congressional elections and um, it, it identifies the main problems with the congressional election system in the U.S. and tries to um, figure out exactly how bad those problems are. And I think uh, the report we just came out with this year shows uh, a congressional election structure in this country that is as bad and as bad uh, as dire straits as it's ever been. Um, we released this report, lab, report last uh, November, and part of the report is that we, we project uh, every congressional district in the United States. Um, and we did this in, in 2012. Uh, we made official projections for 333 districts, um, saying months in advance of the election, this is what's going to happen in these districts. Uh, so that's almost 80 percent of the districts in the country, and all of them were were correct. I mean, we we knew what was going to happen, but not just us. Everyone knew what was going to happen in these districts. It didn't matter who the candidates were, how much money they raised, 
uh, how many people turned out. The outcomes of these districts were predetermined. And we did that again this year. This year, uh, we're projecting uh, outcomes in 375 districts, I think. Um, and we're very confident that maybe not 100%, but at least 98, 98 or 99% of the predictions will be right. The vast majority of voters in American congressional elections uh, will have no influence on the makeup of the House in, in 2014 because the outcomes are already predetermined. Um, and the reason for that is that the way we elect members of the House of Representatives is using uh, a winner-take-all system. In a single-member district, which is what we have, we have one representative per district. Uh, if you get 51% of the votes in that district, you get 100% of the representation. Um, and this causes all sorts of problems. And in the last about year and a half, we've seen two major problems that the winner-take-all system has caused. Uh, in a, in a winner-take-all system where voters uh, really just vote for, for one party almost exclusively from election to election, it's very easy to predict someone that voted for Barack Obama in 2008 uh, is very likely to do so, to vote for the Democrat again in 2010 or 2012. Uh, each individual election will swing a little bit from one party to the other, but the extent to which there are undecided voters, a, a huge chunk of undecided voters in any given congressional election uh, is pretty small. So in 2012, um, in 2012 election, we had a congressional district map that was newly drawn, and um, it was 2012 was actually a slightly Democratic favoring year. But in that election, uh, Republicans won a huge majority, and a substantial majority in the House of Representatives, um, about 30 seats, even though Democrats got more votes. Now, it doesn't matter what party uh, you prefer to make parties, this is clearly. Uh, a violation of one of the most basic tenets of democracy, which is the person or party that gets the most votes should win, should be able to dictate policy. Um, you know, this is the House of Representatives, it's supposed to represent the American people as a whole, and it's not doing that right now. It's, it's just there's something fundamentally broken there. Um, and it's, it, this doesn't just affect uh, Democrats negatively. In fact, in the 2013 election uh, in, in New Jersey, state legislative election. Republicans actually got more votes, but Democrats wound up with 60% of the seats. This is just a fundamental flaw in the whole system of winner-take-all elections. Uh, and it can happen as a result, probably as a result of gerrymandering, which definitely contributed to it in 2012. You can see on this map, uh, some of these district lines look pretty weird. Uh, and and that's, that is largely because a lot of state legislatures were controlled by people with partisan interests over voter interests, and they drew lines that would benefit their party. Um, but New Jersey, in 2013, or in, in the most recent redistricting process, they actually had a bipartisan commission. They drew the lines that most people thought were, were fairly uh, equitable, but it still didn't produce a proportional outcome. It still produced uh, a legislature where the party that got the most votes did not control the legislature. Uh, so that's one big problem. And then, as a result of that election, we then had a government shutdown a few months ago after a, a whole series of congressional crises. Um, the reason those things happen have happened is that the the people that uh, are elected to Congress as a result of our current system have no incentive whatsoever to cross the party line uh, and compromise with the other side. There's no incentive, electoral incentive, to go towards the middle. That's because general elections simply don't matter. As, as I said, uh, in this report, Monopoly Politics 2014, we predict 85% uh, of election outcomes, that means 85% 85, 85 of congressional representatives, uh, they know they're going to win. So they don't need to worry about, about uh, reaching out to voters of the other party. What they need to worry about a little bit, and even they don't need to worry that much about this, but more so, is their primary elections. So uh, the, Republican, the Republican majority, um, when given a choice between uh, between voting in a way that would help them uh, with moderates in the general election or voting in a way that would help them with their party's extreme in the primaries, um, their, their only incentive is to go towards the extreme. And that led to, that has led to a series of crises, it led to the government shutdown, and there's, there's no reason to think that that's going to change. There's no reason to think that either of those things are going to change in the near future. Um, it's, it's very plausible that Democrats will get the majority of votes in 2014 and not take control of the House again. 
Uh, in fact, our projection model that we have in this report suggests that Democrats could get as many as 55% of the nationwide vote and still not get a majority. 55% of the nationwide vote is practically unattainable for Democrats. In, two, in the 2008 election, when Barack Obama ran, uh, they got about 54% support. And that was a major Democratic wave. And the equivalent Republican wave the next time, uh, Republicans only got about 54% of the vote. So uh, a, a victory in the House of Representatives for Democrats seems to be uh, barring an, an unprecedented wave virtually unattainable. Um, so the, that's the state of things right now in Congress. It is pretty dire, uh, and it does cause and call for some significant structural reform. And fortunately, uh, Fairboat has, has come up with a plan to do just that. Uh, we have drawn the, the types of multi-member districts that Chris was talking about for the entire country. And uh, if you use these districts, using fair representation systems, you solve both of these major problems. Uh, with fair representation, you basically ensure that the party that gets the most votes is going to win the most seats. And you also ensure that, that people that are elected to Congress that do actually have an incentive to work with the other side. Uh, so that are elected from the by, the, by the Americans that are in the middle of the ideological spectrum or don't just subscribe to the party line. Party, but um, they have more flexible viewpoints. And there will be legislators that actually represent those interests, and that will make for, make for a much more fluid Congress, a Congress that can actually pass legislation. Um, so if you look at the map we have here, this is, this is the current district plan, and you can see that most of the country is either red or blue. The, the districts that are purple, uh, there's only a handful of them. Those are the only districts that could plausibly be competitive uh, in, in any election. And then if you go to Faro Plan, you see that other than the states that have just one district, uh, every multi-member district in the country would be likely to be represented by both at least one Democrat and at least one Republican. As Chris was talking about, you have Republicans in your city. Um, you would have Democrats from all over the Deep South. Um, and you know, these, these people, the Republicans from New York City aren't going to be the same as the Republicans from, from the South. They're going to have different interests. <coughs> they're, they're not going to necessarily vote always on the party line. But, they, the, but people with more conservative viewpoints living in New York City will have someone that represents them. And that viewpoint will occur in the legislation. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's take a look at, at some of the states Chris was talking about and actually see how the plan works. So let's go to Louisiana. Um, so the plan now is, has these crazy lines. Um, there's two reasons for the crazy lines. One is Republicans want as many seats as possible, and the other is to get one uh, Democratic majority district. Now, uh, some people think that if, if you didn't have to create these uh, Democratic majority districts, it would be possible to, uh, to actually have a couple Democratic seats in a lot of these southern states. But if, as long as, as partisan Republicans are drawing the lines in the South, uh, Fairway released a new report recently that conclusively shows that uh, if, if the Voting Rights Act were, if second two of the Voting Rights Act were, were struck down, uh, Republican state legislators in the South would basically be able to eliminate Democratic representation uh, all throughout. Louisiana, uh, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, all of those majority majority districts can just become Republican. So if you see the partisan split now. Uh, you see a state that is almost entirely red and a little sliver of blue. But all the Democrats that live in Louisiana don't live in that blue district. They actually are dispersed throughout the state, and that includes a lot of African American voters who live in Louisiana but have no African American representative. If you go to the Fairbrook plan, um, then you can see that you know Democrats are just getting one additional seat, so it's not a huge change. Uh, Republicans still have, have a majority. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see the uh, pie charts there. You know, it's still a four-two split. It's, it's a Republican state as it should be, uh, but suddenly all African Americans in the state are able to elect a candidate of choice. Everyone in the state is represented by both parties. And this makes a big difference not just for, for voters uh, in terms of having 
people elected who actually represent their interests, but in terms of the people in Congress are, are going to have uh, incentives to appeal to those voters, to appeal to the moderates in Louisiana. Um, of, in each district, you would have two Republicans and one Democrat. Uh, one of the Republicans would probably be you know, fairly right wing, but the other Republican would be would represent the, the middle section of Louisiana's voters, and that Republican would would not let, likely be inclined to shut the government down. Um, they would be a conservative person, but they would they would be willing to work across the aisle because they would be representing people that they are interested in, in compromise. Um, and this, of course, only doesn't only apply to Republican states. There are I mean, Democratic states that are that have been heavily gerrymandered or just happen to be uh, the political geography of the state happens to be such that Republicans can't get elected. So let's go to Massachusetts. Um, Massachusetts is a state with, with plenty of Republicans there. They elected Scott Brown senator in 2010. They've been around the governor recently, but they haven't. They have nine congressional seats, and they haven't had a single Republican elected to any one of those seats since 1994. Well, Scott Brown could be elected to the Senate, but he can't be elected to Congress. Um, it's just not really feasible right now. Um, and you know, the lines drawn are, are a little weird, but they're not that crazy. I mean, it just happens to be the case that Democrats pretty much throughout Massachusetts are about 60% of the population. Um, and that means that 40% of the population is being completely shut out of representation. There's no real way to address this uh, without going to the kind of fair representation plans that we're talking about. So right now it's 9 0 Democrats. If you go to uh, our plan, we just combine the district lines. We used existing, existing districts uh, as building blocks, and we created three, we call them super districts. Uh, each of those, as Chris said, they have two Democrats and one Republican. Um, and uh, so this, and you can do this all around the country just using existing district lines. Uh, you, you wouldn't do that sort of as an actuality, but just using existing district lines. It's very easy to draw districts. Um, such that both parties are always represented. So that's, that's the basic outline of the plan. Um, in addition to the two, uh, two major problems that I discussed, there are, there are also a number of other issues with the congressional elections. The fair representation voting would also help. For instance, uh, the severe underrepresentation of women uh, in, in Congress right now, I think they have below 20%. Um, and that's, that, uh, can be partly addressed through these fair representation systems. Uh, so political science has consistently shown that in multi-member districts, women are more likely to want to run as part of slave candidates instead of uh, you know, jumping into a race where they're going one-on-one -on -one against a powerful public male incumbent. Uh, so there's, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that uh, under this kind of system, more women are going to be elected. Uh, it's also going to do a lot for racial representation. Uh, even without a Voting Rights Act, as long as states are required to draw these multi-member districts, um, racial minorities are going to be represented because in a, in a three seat district, um, if there are Af enough African American voters to make up more than 25% of the population, they will be guaranteed to be able to elect candidate choice. The lines simply cannot be gerrymandered to the extent um, that, that uh, racial minorities could be shut out of representation under the system. And if you have people drawing lines that uh, do have racial representation in mind, you can actually significantly increase the degree of racial representation, especially in the South, uh, using the system. I think our, our plans um, show that uh, I think between four or five seats in, in the Deep South would uh, be added to the congressional black bodies, probably, uh, under this plan. Um, so that's that's the those are the main selling points of fair representation voting. Um, I will turn it over to Drew Spencer, uh, our staff attorney, who has worked a lot on the actual bill uh, that, would, that would implement this plan, and uh, we're just finishing up drafting it now. Hello, I'm Drew Spencer. I'm the staff attorney at Fair Vote, and I have been working on the bill that will actually help them. So I want to give a little bit of, of history first, though, just to describe where this bill is coming from. Uh, and to explain, sort of in a historical context, uh, just how, how consistent with the, uh, the American legal tradition this is. So, as, as was mentioned before, 
there's no requirement in the Constitution that states have to use single seat districts to elect their congressional representatives, or that they have to use winners at all. Uh, and in fact, if you go back and look at the early elections for Congress, you'll see all sorts of different methods being some states did use single seat districts, some elected at large, some at large, but had to live in certain counties. Uh, lots of different ideas were, were being thrown around. Um, it wound up sort of turning into two parallel systems that were used most commonly. You would either have single seat districts or you'd be electing at large but on a winner take all basis. Uh, very early on, it was recognized that this winner take all basis, so a state might be electing three representatives, but it allows the majority to control all three. And that was very unfair. And if it were adopted by enough states, it could wind up swinging the election in a very undemocratic way. And so, as early as 1842, we start seeing Congress trying to intervene by requiring states to use single member districts. Congress has the authority to do this, they have plenary authority over how Congress is elected, how itself is elected. Uh, and they started doing it in 1842. However, it largely was ignored, it wasn't enforced, and many states continued to elect that large. Uh, and later, uh, later versions of the Apportionment Acts, which is where this mandate took place, uh, it was kept out. So this requirement sort of came and went from the law, and it wasn't in place uh, up until about 1967. Uh, the 1967 mandate was mentioned earlier. This was the Civil Rights era, there were only two states at that point that weren't electing from single member districts. I believe they were New Mexico and Hawaii. Uh, but Congress decided that two states doing this was too, too many. And anyway, they didn't want more states doing it. At a time when we were concerned you know, of the 1965 Voting Rights Act had just passed, we were concerned about the dilution of the votes of racial minorities if states were electing at large on a winner take all basis. But the irony of this was that in forbidding that, they instituted instead a requirement that you use winner take all, but on a single seat district basis. Single seat districts then brought in the wave of gerrymandering and uh, uncompetitive elections that we see to this day. So, in attempting to require a more democratic system, they imposed uh, a significantly imperfect system on every state in the entire country. So, there have been attempts to to undo this, but in a way that brings us forward. So we, we don't want to allow states to go back to using the at-large winner-take-all method. Uh, but bills have been introduced as early as 1994 to allow states to elect at-large or in multi-member districts, but using fair representation voting systems so that the members of those districts are fairly represented, as if they were districted, but without actually having to draw any lines or letting them district themselves with their votes. Um, uh, th these bills continue to be elected, uh, uh, introduced, sorry, as early as 1994, uh, is what I'm going to say. 1999, Mel Watt, Representative Mel Watt, introduced a bill uh, that received a lot of positive testimony, including from, uh, including from the Department of Justice, indicating that these systems do, in fact, have a, have a beneficial role on civil rights, on voting rights for racial minorities. Uh, and um, continue to see bills uh, uh, through 2001. There was, a, there was a bill to establish a commission that would take a look at this, as well as looking at the size of the House itself, asking two questions. How do we want to elect the Congress, and how big exactly should the Congress be? Should it just keep at least arbitrary number 435? Um, our bill is a little bit different from those that have been introduced before. So most of those took the option of saying that the 1967 mandate is repealed. States can do what they want here. They can, they can elect using fair representation voting if they want to, but they don't have to. Uh, this was seen as sort of a more incremental approach, but uh, let's remember that the current state of gerrymandering right now is that states can gerrymander if they want to, but they don't have to. So what do we see? We see states gerrymandering. They see a lot of abuses of the democratic system taking place. And so our approach is instead to say that the states are all going to become fair together that every state is going to start using fair representation voting in much the same way that the single member mandate was saying two states is too many to be using an unfair system. We're going to say that every state, that including the states that uh, where the entrenched political powers might not want to go to a fair representation system, nonetheless are going to elect their representatives fairly and the entire Congress will be elected. You know, there is some value in having this one body elected by a method that's the same across the country. Uh, our bill has a few different, uh, few different aspects of it. So, keeping in mind this, this idea that, that states should be required to do what's fair, it's actually based, the version that's on the website, and this is the page for the Monopoly Politics Report, it's one of the appendices to that report, so you'll find it at the bottom of this website if you visit. 
uh, uses as its basis the John Tenor Fairness and Independent Redistricting Act, uh, the John Tenor Fair Act, introduced by Representative Cohen last year. This was an act that required that all states elect their representatives from districts drawn by independent commissions. So it's a way of saying that gerrymandering isn't going to be allowed. You're going to have to use independent districts in every, every state. This does the same thing, but it says yes, but, but let's go further. Let's say you're going to use independent commissions, but they're going to draw multi-member districts. So this is going to use multi-member districts. This version of the bill allows states to choose the district magnitude, so it has to be at least three, but you could be electing five or seven or even more, depending on the state's choice. Uh, we're working on other versions of the bill that will provide states with different options, uh, or even not require independent commissions at all, that might just say, here are some criteria that you have to follow. Um, sorry for the lack of legislative language. It's very exciting, though. Uh, I encourage you all to read it in your, in your spare time, since we don't seem to be able to pull it up right now. Um, so uh, so that's, the, that's the approach that our, our bill is taking. Every state is going to use multi-member districts, electing at least three candidates at a time, in a way that will ensure that we're going to have shared representation in these districts that will allow every voter to have representation uh, using a fair representation system that's defined in the bill uh, as saying that people above a certain threshold have to be able to elect a candidate. So the simplest way to do that, as was mentioned earlier, is you could just give the voters one vote each. That way, each representative is elected by a different block of voters. So if you're electing two, you're going to have the two largest block of voters, probably Republican and Democrat. If you're electing three, you're going to get, yeah, a Republican and a Democrat. And then maybe a Republican who's, who's not, you know, not as as in line with the party party line as the other Republican, or the same thing for a Democrat. Start electing the left, right, and middle of every district. Um, you could also do this, uh, it, it provides a number of options. So you could do this where you give everyone one vote, but then you look at, at the party of the person who the person voted for. So that if, let's say, 60% of people voted for Democrat, then the Democrats are going to win 60% of the seats in that district. Which Democrats will be elected will be based on candidates. Remember, this is always a candidate-based program. Or you can do it on a ranked choice system. You know, this, this is the option that we're actually recommending the most strongly because then it, you don't have to do a party-based system at all. If 60% of voters vote for Democrats, they still are going to get 60% of the seats. But it also allows for people to say, yeah, my first choice is a Democrat, but my second choice is a Republican. My third choice is an independent. You can cross over, or for that matter, get rid of the parties entirely. Cambridge, Massachusetts uses this ranked choice system to elect its non-seat city council, and it does it in non-partisan elections. So this is, a, this is an election using proportional representation uh, without the need for political parties necessarily. Uh, now, you know, of course, political parties will remain on the ballot, uh, but you don't necessarily have to rely on that. People are voting first and foremost for candidates. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Um, we can't look at the bill right now, unfortunately, but the legislative language is right there based again on the John Tanner Fairness and Independence and Redistricting Act, uh, but implementing uh, fair representation voting in multi-seat districts. Working on versions of this bill that will not require the independent commissions in case that might be seen as more as a preferable approach. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the only thing that we needed is this, this one bill and immediately America goes from a single seat districted winner take all uh, elected Congress one where it's fair representation. So I didn't have anything further out of I'm going to say a word and then we'll take some questions here. So um, thank you for this good presentation. We'll, we'll leave the map up there. It's a fun, very fun tool. You can just, just explore that. But also, if you go back to the original page, uh, there's in-depth analyses, often you know, sort of eight, ten pages, about like what this means for money and politics, what this means for um, partisan bias, what it means for different aspects of things that I think is, is quite telling as well. It also takes on an issue that I just wanted to underscore, which is that we think this, this ultimately does take a national solution. The problem of gerrymandering, as we often commonly understand it, does take a national solution if you really want to get at the problem. You see some very creative, important, useful changes going on in states, uh, which people might be familiar with. You know, Iowa does a different approach and, and so on. But that doesn't affect most people. It doesn't affect most of the country. And it's unlikely to go very far. Um, and that 
trying to do, let's say, an Iowa-style redistributive reform uniformly across the whole country, actually ends up not really dealing with the problem either. And that's uh, sort of a, a, a stark fact that very few editorial writers who often think that's the answer to everything haven't grappled with. Um, but uh, this does. This actually universally opens up elections to voters being able to find them on verification, removes partisan bias, um, and you know, affects things in a way that I think that uh, uh, people who are, uh, are looking for redistributive reform want to do, but, but in fact that is only a partial answer, and we think that we at this time we need to go further. So we had this right to vote conversation earlier, here deeply about really this is a right to representation, which must be a representative democracy, maybe as we perhaps have been asking to think about as well. So we'd love to hear your comments, questions, thoughts, and uh, we are going to be looking for a member to be our leader on this. We want this to be an effort that includes uh, both Republicans and Democrats. And we think it can and it should, and it's one that uh, we, we don't expect it to be an overnight success, but we do expect it to be a success within, within the day. That's our, that's our goal. And we uh, lay out a 2020 reform agenda about why that's possible. But sometimes the things that seem difficult become possible when the problems are as intense as we have the first day. So, um, others can be up here as part of the answering team, but we'd love to, to hear some thoughts and questions from anyone. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that Congress and the 9% approval rate, everybody's sick of parties. Um, and clearly, statistically, any way you measure it, this improves all that. So why, why isn't this a white hot item for libertarians? And, and I'd like to point out that Peter Thiel is the founder of uh, eBay and uh, has more money than uh, Congress uh, is an uber libertarian. Gave more money to Rand Paul than Ron Paul and anybody else. Uh, but it seems to me that school of people would really want to support this, and that's what it takes. Right. Yeah, we, we call this fair representation voting. Another way to talk about it is free voting, in a sense, because it's right, you're free to choose. You're free to have your own representative. Someone's not doing the choosing for you. I think it is something that uh, has an appeal to the free and the fair. And yeah, I think that it is a, it is a non on our board, Bill Redtown, he's on the National Libertarian Party, National Committee. And uh, with this, when I, in my opening remarks, I spoke about the misconceptions and the myths. A lot of people just don't realize that we have this option. You know, you know people, that's, uh, that's how they vote in Italy or something. It's like, no. Or, or I even get this thing where, like, well, Chris, you're proposing a parliamentary system. I'm like, no, I mean, we don't, I'm not proposing a prime minister in Washington and a party, you know, a party coming together, you know, for him to be in government. It's like, um, it's just getting the word out. It's like, well, I could think but we're getting, but so we're getting more and more, we're gaining more and more traction with uh, Norm Norrison and Thomas Mann, I think that's where it looks. It's even worse than you think, right? It's even worse than you think. It's even worse than it looks. Congress mandated one single approach. 
and this would be like, well, let's not, let's, 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 let's remove that mandate and give states the right to do that. So we would love to see that bill. We also, though, want to really take on the problems with the House, and we'd like to see a bill put forward that does that. And, 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 and I, I think you're right that it will be a, a multi-step conversation, right? But I think that also, um, it's not going to be the defeat of, uh, most members of Congress will, will, will win under this system, right? It's, it's, they, will, they, they will run in competitive elections that are different, um, but that uh, uh, they come in having a constituency of having been elected in those voters, if they've been serving them well, we'll continue to like them, and that's an incredibly good base of people to be elected with. Um, and, but I think that also uh, we need to have a conversation about what the country needs and, 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 and how, how to make Congress work under the Constitution. And I think that there's an argument right now that our constitutional regime isn't working very well. And that, that creates a climate that's not good for the country. And I think that's a conversation that we think will ultimately spur um, action and, and, and thinking about the best way to do something about it. But really, and so it's the only way. That's the, that's the challenging notion here. This is really the only way to deal with the core problems. And it's a challenging notion. We either just have to live with the problems, or we have to take on this scary idea that we become less and less scary, I think, the more we look at it. Does anyone else have Yes? Um, so whenever I hear libertarians taking a power, that kind of scares me. It's being more from the left side of, uh, it comes with an impact on women and people of color that you like comes from the libertarian sphere. So how, how would we balance out different like policies that are good for the U.S. with this system? Would that increase more people from like, wanting to push the country backwards getting elected? Like, how does ideology, how does it push the country There could be a Green Party or some new, new types of party that are, you know, opposite of libertarianism. But again, if you look at the, the thresholds of elections, of, in our plans, it's very, it's more likely we have Republicans and Democrats, and then we have a kind of different, than what uh, Drew and um, Devin said, there'd be a different version of these two uh, Republicans and Democrats. It'd be, you know, if you have one that's more on the left, and then there's a centrist one. There's one that's more on the right, and there's the centrist one. Yeah, and I, and, and I think that um, you need a system that creates access for people. You need to have a system that represents people. And that's partly, it's like the golden rule of representation. They give unto others the representation that one would love for oneself. And, and, and that's a sense what representative democracy has to be. And that uh, um, that's the value that we, we want to stand on. I and mean, I think that that's a good place to be. Um, I think that um, if you have a reform that clearly is going to advantage one side versus the other, you have one side that will support it and one side that never will. I think that um, one of the values of reforms that, that we really just level the playing field is get people on. I'll just say briefly, how many of you are familiar with the National Popular Vote Plan for President to change the presidential system? Um, because that proposal um, is a way for states to work together to effectuate a uh, national popular vote for president, effectually having a, a direct election for a president where every vote in every state counts equally. Uh, to determine who will win the presidency. That's passed in um, nine states in D.C. Uh, it just passed the Oklahoma State Senate, which is a Republican uh, body and a Republican state. Um, and it's mostly moved to Democratic states so far. And it's been seen like the people said the 2000 election. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you're about to war Bush on Tuesday. It's like, no, this is about something that's leveling well the playing field, whatever it was equal. And, um, and more Republicans are starting to say, no, you're right. But if it was clearly going to advantage one side or the other, it just wasn't going to do it. It's not going to go all the way. I think that one will go all the way. It's also an example, by the way, I think if you talk to people a decade ago and said, hey, in, uh, by 2020, we're going to have a national popular vote for president to sign the presidency, people would say, no, you're not. But I think we absolutely will. Um, and, and, and that's an example of change that is, more, is, 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 is possible um, when people start saying, oh, you can have change. Yes. So today we, because of you know, single member districts and different term limits, we have the House and the Senate represent, or have different systems of representation. The House represents a smaller defined constituency, whereas the Senate represents states. I'm wondering, well, I'm from Connecticut, so um, under your plan it will be a 
five mem one five member super district that remains the entire state. I'm just wondering how this will affect representation for constituents. Um, so that's, there's you know different areas in the state have different issues, and how this will affect you know, campaigning. There are have issues where um, because of the two year cycle, uh, it seems that Congress is always campaigning. Now instead of campaigning in a smaller district, they're have to campaign all across the state. Um, will they know their constituency as well? All great questions. So thank you. Um, I think that um, we have a lot of history of knowing how multi-seat districts work for representation because they're quite common in state legislatures. I have three members in the Maryland House of Representatives. Um, and uh, as recently as the 50s, more than half of state legislators were elected in multi-seat districts. Uh, early on in Congress, a lot of them were elected statewide. So there's things that we can look at and, and the norms that they develop for that. Um, one thing is that in Tennessee, if you see more cooperation across staff lines, um, you see people because they're sharing constituents and they can, they're, they're, they're sharing the problems of their constituency, they will talk more, which actually when you combine with this, you know, it's a fair representation system, you'll, you'll actually sort of get inherently some, some nice cross-partisan dialogue and cooperation going on. Um, different people were, were, are, are going to do different things as candidates and as representatives. Um, the math of it is that you need 17% to win. Um, then you don't want to only appeal to 17% of people and piss off 83% because that's kind of nice. Um, but, but you also don't need to try to appeal to everyone. You need to represent some people really well. And they want to keep you there in at least you know, about a fifth of the vote once that. And that uh, often will have a geographic definition. Not necessarily, but it usually has some geographic definition. Um, but it can be other things too, right? And 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 um, there will be just sort of different different ways that, that people end up being, being uh, someone who uh, has 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 urgency and and and, and uh, you know, kind of does things to to, to stay in office. Um, it will change some of the campaigning. The, the thing that's interesting about multi-seat districts versus single-member districts it, now, it, like some states have have, have a mix, they tend not to spend more money. Seems totally counterintuitive, right? Even under winner take all systems, they tend not to spend more money. And it's because one is some money spent on ads and they, they kind of diffuse to more people than you need to. A lot of congressional districts, if you look at them now, are already kind of getting different 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 districts, um, or different cities and so on. Um, and um, but you also can do more cooperation. So you might share a campaign manager with someone or, or you might share at least something where someone on your say your same party you at least do some more things together. That's just sort of the fact of how it's been working at the state level. Um, but um, you know those, those those are the things that we need to be talking about intensively. I think those are the good questions for this nice quick attempt. Yes. This is 